But so as most of you know, I'm Joey Lovestrand. I'm a postdoctoral fellow at SOAS University of London uh, here to hosting this linguistics webinar uh, for our department. And we're excited to have Guillaume Guitang here to present uh, his work on the ethnobiology biology of Maso, Maso languages. Guillaume's a PhD student at the Université Libre de Bruxelles, uh, where he's working on primarily the description of the grammar of Gizé. He's also been involved in work at Lacan, uh, including the Discourse Reporting Project. Uh, previously did a master's in linguistics at the University of Boya in Cameroon. Uh, and he's also one of the leaders of the Chetic Languages and Cultures Working Group. So if anyone is interested in this kind of presentation and wants to be part of that group, uh, you can contact Guillaume later about how to be involved in those monthly meetings. So Guillaume, thank you for coming today and being willing to present this uh, project that you've been working on for a while. And we look forward to uh, hearing what you have to say. Yeah. So thank you, thank you, thank you very much, Joey, uh, uh, for, for the introduction. And thank you for, for, for having me here. I also wish to thank all of you for, for coming. It's a, it's a real pleasure for me to, to share a part of my work on, on Gizeh and more generally on, on, the, on the Maasai languages. Now, uh, just, just uh, to be sure, if you ever get the impression that the, the, the quality of my microphone is not stable, please don't hesitate to, 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 to stop me uh, so that I, I fix the things. Okay, so uh, I think we can start slowly while other people are joining. Okay, so uh, as you can see from the title, uh, I'm going to, to discuss uh, to, to briefly overview uh, the linguistics uh, ethnobiology of, of a few Masa, uh, Masa languages. So uh, what I'm going to do, as I said, is overview the structure of animal and plant name in the Masa languages. Uh, I will specifically look at the linguistic side of uh, Masa folk taxonomy. Uh, that is the, 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 the morphological structure of, of, uh, of animal and plant uh, labels. What I will not do is uh, uh, do a, a systematic uh, examination of uh, Masa, uh, Masa taxonomies. Uh, that is, I will not look at the underlying conceptual structure behind the names that I'm going to, to show to you. I will not also uh, systematically point at uh, correspondences or lack of correspondence between uh, Massa folk taxonomy and the Linnean, uh, the Linnean more uh, scientific uh, classification, which you should be aware of. For example, I will not tell you if, uh, if Masa, Masa taxonomies or Masa taxonomy do uh, things like over dif differentiation, that is cases where uh, you take the same species in the, in the linear classification and, and the, Masa, the, the Masa languages uh, create uh, two or maybe uh, uh, three species out of the same, uh, out of the same species. I will not also point at things like on the, on the dif differentiation that is, I avoid doing that, and I guess you understand why I'm not a biologist, I'm just a linguist. So uh, I will limit myself to the, to the linguistics reflection of, of the taxonomies. Now, you may, I, I, I will not try to convince you on the importance of uh, reviewing uh, the names of plants and animals in given communities, uh, just to point out that, uh, as uh, for example, Berlin points out, uh, the names of plants and animals reveals much about the way uh, the ways people conceptualize uh, the living things in their in their environment. And I hope by as as we go through the presentation, you are able to see exactly how uh, Masa communities conceptualize the living things in their environment. That is also one important thing. Uh, it, it provides very useful insights into the history of of communities. Uh, the names of plants and animals uh, as other words in the, in the languages document uh, uh, the specifically for, for, for names of plants and animals, they, they document uh, geographical trajectories, uh, changes in the lifestyles of the people, uh, changes in the environment. They, they become real archaeological material in time of rapid uh, environmental changes. And from, from a more linguistics perspective, uh, it also provides insights into the processes involved uh, in the creation, 
and maintainers of words uh, in, in given communities. Uh, and this poses once more the stubbornly persistent question about uh, uh, the arbitrary or not arbitrary nature of, of words. I will, I will show, I will show uh, throughout the presentation that there is some non-arbitrariness in the ways uh, uh, the names of plants and animals are, are formed in these languages. I will specifically uh, point at how the characteristics of plants and animals are projected uh, into, into their names. So uh, this is what I will, I will cover. I will give some background information on, on the languages. Then I will walk you through uh, different uh, types of animals and plant names in these, in these communities. So let's go, let's start with some background information on, on the languages uh, discussed in, in the presentation. So I have said it already from, from the beginning. So I'll be working, I'll be talking about the uh, Maasa languages and the Maasa languages I, dis I discussed are part of Chadik which is composed of four branches, West, Bumandara, uh, uh, Bumandara and East, plus Asa, as you can see, you can see from here. And Chadik itself is part of Afro-Asiatic, which is generally accepted to, to involve uh, Semitic, Omotic, Ushutic, uh, uh, and Berber languages, uh, including also Chadik, as I said. So you, you can see Chadik in blue on this part. Now, the Masa branch itself uh, um, in, involves two, two groups, a northern and a southern group. So in this presentation, I'm going to focus specifically on the northern branch, uh, the northern group of Masa, uh, which involves uh, uh, two sections. We have the Masa section, which involves Masana, uh, the Gizeh Wina continuum, and there is Zumaya, which is an extinct uh, language. Then you have the Muse section, which involves Muse, Ham, and the Marbaleu, uh, uh, Marbaleu Monogoy uh, continuum. So when I, when I use the term continuum here, uh, I, I wish to, to point uh, the fact that uh, some, of, some, of, some of the members of the, of the continuum, uh, there are questions about their, their exact status whether they're independent languages or part of, of a dialectal, uh, dialectal continuum. Now, the languages, the languages hidden from the southern group or from the northern group, uh, the Maasai languages are mostly under-described, and some of them are not described at all. Uh, it is the case, for, for example, of Ham, which is, which is totally not described, and uh, Milit has rightly pointed out that this is a language that might be uh, in real in real danger now uh, and for those for those languages that have had some descriptions as you would expect uh, the literature the literature is generally very uh, uh, fragmentary and as Joe said in the beginning I am currently preparing a grammatical description of Gizeh uh, with financial support from the Université Libre de, de Bruxelles that is the promo the promo moment and I'm just telling you this because uh, I'm sure you're going to observe a Gizeh bias in the data that I, that I show. Now, uh, if we, we look at the, the, the location of the languages on, on, on the map, so most of these languages span the, the Cameroon, the Cameroon Chad uh, borders. You have Massa, Masana, which is here. Uh, you have the Gizeh Wina continuum here around the Fianga Lake. You have Musei, which is here. You have Marba, Marba Leo, which is here. And then you have uh, the tiny Ham community, which is, uh, which is also uh, here. Now, uh, a few words about uh, the data uh, that, I'm, that I'm going to discuss. So most of this data uh, come from dictionaries or, or draft dictionaries uh, of these languages. You, you, have, them, you have them there. Diction, a draft dictionary of Muse, you have a dictionary of Massa, a dictionary of Gizeh, and here a dictionary of Marba. This one uh, is a comparative word list, which involves uh, something like uh, 1,400 entries uh, from Gizeh, Ham, Leo, Marba, Masana, and, and Muse. 
So it's, it's, also, it's also very useful and you have various entries concerning plants and animals in, uh, uh, in that work is, and it is, it is well, well, well organized. Now, apart from, from the data in this draft, draft dictionary by Schweirock, uh, most of the animal and plant names that I'm going to discuss were connected by Antonino Melis. I think I saw Melis here. Bonjour, Padre. And so Melis, Melis is, a, is a biologist, he's a linguist, uh, uh, and he is currently acting as the director of the Centre Culturel du, du, et Musée de la Vallée du Logon in Yagua. And you can, you can Google, you can Google uh, uh, Centre Culturel Musée de la Vallée du Logon. There is a, a very informative website that you can consult, or you can use the QR code that I, that I prepared there if you have time to scan it. Okay. Now, so this is just to give you uh, an idea, a general idea of the number of entries that uh, are tagged as botanical or zoological uh, vocabulary uh, in, the various, uh, in the various sources. You probably have less than what is indicated there, apart from the, the comparative uh, lexicon, which for which I have, I'm sure about the exact figures because I counted them manually. But for the other ones, they, they need to be cleaned. So this is just an indication of the, the amount of botanical and zoological information that you find in, in these sources. I was not able to retrieve uh, the information from, from the dictionary of Musée, yeah, because it is not structured in exactly the same way as the, as the, as the others. And so um, now, uh, as you would expect, there are there are gaps in the in these uh, in these sources uh, probably because of the kinds of data that we use and because of the because also of the question of the, the training that we have some of the people working on, on these languages are, are, are linguists alone not biologists at the same time as it is the case for Medis. so you you have entries like in the draft dictionary of uh, uh, of muse a plant you can't exactly identify it uh, which plant, and you, you have the same situation even uh, for, 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 for biologists, it is, it is something sometimes very difficult to, to identify all the elements. So you have examples here of uh, uh, a kind of mouse that is edible, but you can't, you can't, retrieve, you, you can't retrieve the identity of, uh, of the, the exact mouse that is, that is indicated there. So it is, it is generally not an, not an easy, easy task. And also, uh, for, for my case, for example, uh, in the narrative data that we that we collect, you, you you have names of plants and animals that show up in the in the data, and you can't exactly identify uh, the the item. So it is not a perfect set of data, but I'm sure you you will find a lot of interesting stuff in in what I show. I think we are now set to go into the details of the animals and plant names in these languages. But before, another background stop uh, about terminology so that we are sure uh, exactly of the terminology that I, that I use here. So basically, uh, uh, what I'm using is Conklin's uh, 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 terminology. And Conklin's uh, identifies uh, two kinds of labels for animals and plant names in, in different communities. So there are composite labels like uh, uh, the example that you have, the white oak. So composite labels are labels that involve a, a head word, which specifies a taxon or a category. And then you have an attributive element which, which qualifies that head word. Uh, and it is the case, for example, of white oak, where oak uh, is a taxon, is a category, and then you have white, which is the attributive, which qualifies uh, oak. And then you have unitary, unitary labels. Uh, unitary labels are those labels that do not show the, the, the kind of endocentricity that you find with, uh, with, composite, uh, with composite labels. With unitary labels, you have two, two, two types, two subtypes. You have simple ones. That is those that are unsegmentable, like oak. It is not segmentable further. And then uh, you have the complex ones, like poison oak. So these are basically these are uh, exocentric, uh, exocentric compound in the sense that they do not show the same uh, endocentricity with, uh, which you find here with composite labels. So 
uh, clearly a poison oak is not a kind of oak. So basically, uh, that is that is the idea. Now, the 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 other terminology that you terminologies that you find in the literature, you have uh, Berlin, uh, which uh, which comes with other flavors. So basically, he distinguishes between primary labels and secondary labels. Uh, in the same, uh, the in the, the primary labels uh, can be simple, like fraud, unsegmentable. Then you have the complex ones, uh, which can be productive, like catfish. A catfish is a kind of fish. And then you have the unproductive ones, like silverfish. Silverfish is not a kind of fish. It is not a silver. It is a, it is a, a, an insect. And then you have the secondary labels, uh, like white oak, uh, which are always complex. And they, they often uh, uh, they always involve paradigmatic contrast uh, with other kinds of the, the head word. Uh, as white oak as you have there. I think uh, we've now seen uh, the terminology, so everything is clear. We can now go into the details uh, about the labels in the Massa uh, languages. So I will not come back to these definitions, maybe just uh, just a few. Let us discuss the, the data from the languages. Now, so the composite labels. So uh, the understanding that we get from, from what I said so far is that composite labels are endocentric. So they, they often, uh, they, they, they always describe a, a, a kinds of the head word or subclasses of, of the head. So these are examples from, from Gizeh. So you have a who, which is the head term, which refers to caprine, and then uh, who plus these attributives, who make, who may, who gamli, who dimi, who pat, uh, identify uh, uh, different categories of uh, subcategories of the category head. And so these are the attributive elements. So I just want to point a few things here. The, the, the items that you see here, nga, da, na, da, and na, these are determiners. These are, these are items that uh, provide information about uh, definiteness and gender number. And so uh, you, you, you can hardly, you hardly pronounce a noun in these languages uh, without the, the article. I don't, I don't know them systematically, but I think in pronouncing, in pronouncing uh, the nouns, I, I think I always uh, include them uh, uh, when, I, when I say the names. So don't get surprised if I say a na and you don't see the, a na written there. Now, the other thing is that uh, the attributive elements, the meanings of these attributive elements are, are sometimes very difficult to identify independently. And the reason for, for it is that uh, some, uh, in some cases, the attributives can stand alone as the names of the species. So for example, if I say divida, you understand that I'm referring to, to the you. Uh, if I say gablina, it's a ram. If I say neka, you understand that it is the billy goat. And this is what Conklin uh, uh, refers to as abbreviation in, in this definition. And also, the moment you use the word who, we, we understand that you are referring at least to one of uh, the members of these categories. Uh, that is what uh, is referred to as generalization in this, uh, in this definition. Now, uh, I think I've, I've, I, I talked already uh, about, uh, about this. So these composite labels, so the composite labels are also uh, called binomial uh, binomial labels. So the binomial labels are head initial. I said it already. So you have the head, which specifies the, the, the set of categories, and then you have the attributives that come after. Now, if you if you examples, so if you have uh, these examples from Gizeh, chal, which is a common noun for many fish species. So you have chal du. Chakor, Chakurium, Chakleng, which is the strong one. As you can see, I, the, the meaning of Leng can, 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 be, can be identified, whereas the other ones uh, are more <laughs> difficult to, to get. Uh, the same thing here for Guk, which refers to Kulumbide. So you have Guk Bule, which is a speckled pigeon uh, versus green pigeon, Berber. Bile, the loving dove, including the African morning dove. So these are animal examples from the zoological vocabulary. Here you have examples from uh, uh, binomial labels in, in plants. So uh, uh, you have the examples of which is kurdi, and then you have the kurdi, which is 
the kurdi, the dam kurdi, the kokomba, you have the kurdi, which is the kurdi of the, the, the hyena, which is the horn melon, uh, the colescent, I think this is usually called egusi, I think this is this should be egusi, which is the pon kurdi, and then you have this one, which is the, the kurdi of the squirrel. Uh, barang is grass, and so you have the red barang here, and then you have other, other subcategories. Now, contrary to the image that I'm trying to portray uh, with these examples, there are only very few labels that have more than three subclasses. Usually, it is a maximum of two, as you can see uh, uh, from these examples from Marba, Gizeh, uh, Masana, uh, yes, and Masana. And I'm going to, I'm going to, to, to review some of, some of these uh, structures because I'm going to discuss the attributives, yeah, from now. So basically, uh, when you look, uh, you can factor out two uh, structural patterns in, in these binomial, uh, binomial labels. Uh, the first pattern uh, involves a relator. So you have a, the head, the category noun, uh, which does not involve an internal determiner. And then you have a relator. Some may want to call it copula, but it's a relator. And then uh, you have uh, a second element, which is either a noun or an idiophone in this position. And then you have an external determiner. Uh, so it is either Deidang Kikuruta or Deidang Huruta for the black scrub robin. And then the second pattern, you have uh, the head now. So this, this pattern always uh, uh, expresses alienability. So you have uh, the head with an internal determiner. And then you have the preposition, preposition V, of, and then you have a second NP uh, with an external uh, uh, determiner. So these are two structural patterns, and I'm going to look at them in detail now. So for the first pattern is the relator. The, the second item uh, always indicates uh, color, texture, or sex. You have a few examples from Gizeh. So if you take WAC, uh, so the pawn Aaron. Uh, is the white is the white heron, the white crested tiger heron is the black the black heron. Uh, the same thing for the the snake nei nei, which is white for the rufous big snake. Uh, jumun uh, jumun the male one the male jumul and the female uh, jumun. So that is the the contribution the usual contribution of attributives in these uh, in these examples. Now. Uh, I, when I talk uh, here, I said, okay, the relator can be overt or covert, but there are, there are examples like this one where uh, it seems you need to use uh, the relator. For example, when you say birem, birem majufma, the male, the male birem, it, it must be there. Dauma uh, fulla, you must use the relator there. But in some cases, like for you, when you put, the relator there, it is possible, but does not sound good. And so I've been wondering, because this kind, this kind of structure, you also find it out of the out of the fauna and flora uh, vocabulary, as you can you can see here. So I've been wondering whether these indicate two uh, different stages of lexicalization, something from phrasal labels to something like compound labels. This is not much of our concern here, but I just wanted to point it out. Uh, this. Now, the second pattern is the one involving alienability. And uh, so basically, uh, we, we discussed the structure already. So these are examples here. You have Sueda Vihina, uh, which is the ground nut of, of the squirrel. So you still have the, the head item, which specifies the, the, the category. It is a kind of ground nut, but it is, it is described as the, the ground nut of, uh, of, uh, of the squirrel. The same thing here for the secretary bird, which is referred to as uh, the fowl of God. So it is a fowl, uh, but belonging to God. So, uh, and you can see already uh, a simplification here. So here you don't have the V that you find here, but you find the internal determiner, uh, as, I, as I said. Now, okay. Uh, we've seen binomial uh, binomial uh, labels. We can now uh, look at the unitary unitary ones, uh, which 
constitute most of the of the vocabulary, the plant and animal vocabulary in these uh, in these languages. So, as I said in the beginning, the unitary labels are those that do not involve the kind of uh, uh, endo endocentricity that we had with uh, with the binomial ones. And um, uh, according to, as I said also in the beginning, the simple ones are all segmentable. Then you have the compound ones that are segmentable. And then I, I am proposing that we we specify a third category of reduplicatives, which uh, uh, say some different stories that need to be to be to be discussed independently. Now, the simple ones, I will not spend uh, much time on them, just to tell you that this is the most frequent type. Uh, you can find examples here from Marba and Gizeh. I'll just ask you to pay attention to this prefix that I isolated. I'm going to come back to it uh, by the end of, of the talk. Now, the compound ones. So basically, uh, as I said, these are endo endo exocentric uh, compounds. That is compounds that are not analyzable, at least superficially, as denoting hyponyms of, uh, of an internal head. So they are not kinds of the head. And basically, there are two structures. So there, there are metaphor-based ones, and there are also meta metonymy based uh, compounds. And I'm going to show you exactly uh, the distinction. So let's begin with the, the metaphor-based ones. So the metaphor-based unitary compounds have uh, the structure of endocentric compounds. Like they are just like the binomial ones. They involve an N1, the conceptual referent, which is analyzable metaphorically as a semantic or syntactic head. And there is an, a second NP, which is the complement of, of N1. So these constructions generally uh, express alienability or uh, inalienability, as I'm going to show. So for those that express uh, uh, alienability, uh, as I said, you, you have the same structure as the binomial ones. So you have the examples here, Kulum Hurduda, the horse of the scorpion. So uh, it, is, it is a kind of spider. You would agree with me that uh, uh, in the linear classification, you wouldn't put uh, spiders in the category of horses. So this is just a metaphorical uh, uh, projection of the qualities of the horse on that spider. Uh, you have a simple example here, Sudei uh, Dina. So these are feces of the dog. You would agree with me that an insect can't be uh, the feces of dogs. And so, uh, okay, so in some cases, I, I put uh, some information here that is useful in, in the way uh, to, to say how people conceptualize uh, uh, animals and plants. So here, the belief is that uh, uh, if rain drops on Dogs, feces, the, the fecal uh, matter transforms into, into these this insects, which looks like a, a, a flying termite. So, but it has not been, been identified. I don't know if the, the, the Massa people here can, can tell me more about, <laughs> about this insect. Now, these are other examples. So, if you take the, the example of the Nile perch, uh, which is the child of the fish. So the Nile perch can't be the child of the fish, but the, this projection uh, of the qualities of child on, on, the, on the fish. And I, I put some examples here, uh, the ways the different languages refer to, to, the, to, the same, to the same item. So you can see Ham and Muse have an original uh, word, which is, which is similar. And then, uh, you have masana, which uses uh, gokuluk like in Gizeh, and then there is also go silei. Silei here is the word for tilapia. And then you can see from marba, marba in the marba level continuum that uh, they either use gokuluk or uh, gor plus uh, the thing that ham and muze use. So uh, it is interesting to see the different ways, the different directions things go. Now, uh, oh, okay, I've talked about this. So if you take the case of Kulum Hurduda, you can have it as Kuluma vi Hurduda, where you have uh, the internal determiner and the, the preposition of. So uh, also thinking about two lexicalization things, but this is not very important. Now, uh, going now to the genetic, genetic constructions that express inalienability. So they have this structure, so you have N plus N, followed by uh, uh, an external determinant. 
So uh, this is an example here from Gizeh del Buka. So you have, uh, it, it means literally the neck of the pigeon. So the concept, the concept, conceptual reference is neck. And uh, the, so this, this, uh, this plant is uh, metaphorically a kind of neck. So there is this metaphorical uh, projection that you, you, you also see here. So these are other examples from, from Masana. So basically uh, you see, no, wait, yeah. So these are examples from Masana. So you, you find things like uh, the heel of the elephant, the testicle of the squirrel, the foot of the bird, the teeth of the viper, uh, the teeth of the bush cat, etc., etc. So there is always this idea of, uh, of. So I call these ones relational compounds, as they, they involve uh, 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 the projection of body parts onto onto a specific uh, uh, reference. Uh, so okay, so this this was botanical uh, vocabulary. Here you have zoological uh, vocabulary. So you have the tail of the sardine, the tongue, the tongue of the cattle. And then there are examples like these ones in which you, 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 you seem to identify something, but you can't retrieve, you can't, uh, retrieve the, the exact metaphor because uh, you can't identify the, the content of the, the second item. So if you take the case of the Namakwa Deo, so you have Deo, which is actually neck, and then uh, you don't know if it is the neck of something. So since you can't, you can't, uh, uh, you can't get the meaning of the second item, it breaks the identification of the, of the metaphor. But generally, uh, if consultants can identify uh, the plant or animal, they, they can point uh, at the exact metaphor that is, that is found there. So maybe this is, this is something that, that needs to be, to be done more uh, properly. So the patterns of the uh, metaphor-based uh, 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 constructions expressing in, a, in, a, in a inability that I've shown so far, the, what the, you, you always have an N1, which is a body part now, as I pointed out, teeth, head, eye, foot. And then you have an N2, which is the name of an animal, elephant, squirrel, bush cat, fowl, etc. So it is always a zoological extension, never a botanical one. So for example, you can find things like uh, the branch or the hand of the acacia, to refer to a kind of snake. No, you, you, don't, you don't find such things. And it is already interesting in, in itself that it is, it is always an animal, uh, a zoological extension projection that is, that is done. And uh, I need to quantify this exactly, but I feel there are more metaphor-based uh, compounds in the flora vocabulary than there are in the, in the fauna vocabulary. You can see in the, the, the zoological, zoological vocabulary, I give you two examples, whereas here you have plenty of them. Now, you, have, you also have genetic constructions expressing inalienability, but uh, which are not relational compounds, that they don't involve uh, body part projection on, on the reference. So uh, you have examples here, uh, so Etna, which is the, the mother of the wind. Uh, apparently, if you feel cold, if you eat uh, the Sumzimetna, uh, then you also have the mother of the soil, the Sumnaga, Sumnagata, which is the Saran San Boa, uh, and which also refers at the same time uh, to, um, to this insect that, is, that uh, was not identified. And apparently, if you hit the ground singing Sumnagata, 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 this insect comes out of its habitat and dances to the tune of, of, of your song. So, yeah, so this is, this is some interesting uh, uh, information on, on, on the insect. Now, uh, let's look at the metonymy-based uh, uh, unitary compounds. So basically, the metonymy-based ones are uh, compounds whose uh, composite meanings capture a specific characteristic of, of their reference. Uh, the meanings that are usually expressed uh, by, these, uh, by these labels are uh, the X that does Y, the X that is located in Y, etc. cetera. You, you will see some of the meanings in the examples that I, that I show. So you have the examples, the example there from Gizeh, the Spanish fly, which is actually, uh, which means literally, it haunts you for no good reason. 
And then you have other examples, uh, cool he, which is an unidentified grass, the thing that lies in the middle of the hill, uh, the harlequin quail, uh, the thing that lies in the middle of water, uh, torbuze, the thing that scratches uh, testicles. So actually this is a fish and the belief is that, uh, voila, so I let you picture the, the image. So you, you eat the fish and you have your, your testicles that, that begin to scratch. I don't know exactly how. And then uh, there is this example of the gulonguru, uh, which I'm not very sure, but it seems like it is the thing that makes the water, uh, the pond, not the bond, the pond black. And then you have other examples. I promised on Twitter that I, I was going to have a, a, a slide on, on, on the beautiful pond bird. So this is it. So uh, basically uh, the, the beautiful song bird, there is also a belief about it. Uh, the, the belief is that you, you live only 10 years after eating the beautiful song bird. And so that belief is presented in the way uh, the, the bird is named in these languages, because uh, you, can, you can see from, from the Gizeh form, you are years are 10. So basically everything is said there. So you eat it, you die after 10 years. So that's the belief. And it is interesting to see how the other languages render uh, the same thing. So you have ham, which encodes that same belief. You have masala, which encodes it here too. And then you have marbale, which has an original uh, original word. And then Gizeh also use, uses jet, uh, jet, which is uh, something uh, different from, from the, the more, I don't want to call it humorous, but uh, the more uh, descriptive one. And then we also have uh, this word, yagvianga, and the yak here is, is like an imperative saying, let go, let go that thing. And the viang is a, is a parasitic, uh, parasitic plant. And the, the idea is that the, the beautiful songbird always sits on, on the, on the yak, on the vianga. And so they tell it, let, let go the vianga and do something else. So something in that direction. You have the example of the bayat fish, which uh, which people think uh, when you I don't know if I don't know if it is exact that when it freezes when you 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 hold uh, it, it beard, and so they, they tell they tell the the bayat fish don't spoil your beard, and that is what is rendered here as uh, black uh, jerengdi which is a yeah which is a negative uh, imperative don't spoil uh, your beard and it is interesting also to see how the other languages uh, render it so ham uh, always and i'm going to come back to why ham has uh, original uh, uh, labels you have uh, jogolong here in muse and then uh, still the same prefix here in in marbaleo masuk uh, then you have Bulak Jerengi, which is the same thing as in Gizeh. And then uh, Masana uh, makes a distinction apparently between the, the, the young and the, the adult um, uh, bayad fish. And you see that the adult one is exactly the same word used in Ham. And Jumolo looks quite similar to what you find here in, in Mosaic 2. Uh, final example with the metonymy based one. So the, the, the purple starling, which is uh, which loves sitting in soil that was washed out by rain. And so you have luck, luck, which is watch out soil. And then you have uh, uh, Lue, which is rain. So also the projection of the, 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 the feature of, of that bird onto, onto the name. Okay. Uh, I think we can uh, go to the end of uh, the, the, the talk. Now, let me just quickly discuss the reduplicative ones. So I'm going to go quick on it. So basically, these are, these are labels that involve the doubling, either complete or partial, you know, reduplication of some base. You have example here with a partial reduplication, chigil for this snake. And then you have to wait to wait for the spore wing, uh, lap wing. So still data from design. Now, there are two patterns that I'm going to discuss. There is partial CV, CV or CVC reduplication, and then you have total reduplication. 
So the first, the partial identification pattern, you can see it uh, in this example. So it is always the identification of, of the last syllable of, uh, of a base. Uh, you have examples here. So you have a zoological uh, vocabulary here, and then here it's botanical uh, vocabulary. Uh, the, the CVC partial identification indexes length, straightness, and large quantity. Uh, about length and straightness, you can see basically when you look at it, it always refers to snakes or other other animals that have a long feature. And the same the same pattern is found out of uh, fauna and flora vocabulary. Uh, you can see it from the word "digiugiu," very long, meaning in larger in large quantity. The analysis I make of these forms is that there is one characteristic characteristic of the base. Which, uh, which is an iconic representation of a feature of, uh, of the, the, the animal or the plant. And then there is a long, there is a long feature of, of the, the, the animal or the plant which triggers a CVC duplication. So uh, if you take the case of the Senegal Kukal, so uh, in terms when you find people imitating the sound of the Senegal Kukal, it is always so I have the impression that you have an imitation of the call, which is Buduk, and then you have a long feature, in my opinion, which triggers, uh, 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 which triggers the CVC duplication. And I was wondering if it is not related to the tail of this bird. So you tell me what you what you think about this analysis. Now there is uh, the last category of reduplicatives are the total reduplicative ones. So uh, and you have total reduplication, which is iconic, and you have total reduplication, which is not iconic. For the iconic case, uh, you have uh, an iconic representation of some important feature of the, of the plant or the, or the animal. So in the case of animals, it is sometimes easier, because if you take the case of uh, the black winged steel, it is actually an imitation of the call, uh, of, the call of, the, of the bird, creo, 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 or gireo, 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 depending on how it is rendered. But in some cases, it is very difficult to get the, 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 the item that triggers the total reduplication. So if you take uh, this caterpillar, which is not identified, you can now you, you, can't, you can't say exactly what is the feature that triggers uh, the, the total reduplication. And the same difficulty is found in, in botanical vocabulary because, uh, I, I mean, it is uh, what makes uh, the tambuki grass be rendered as corley corley. The same thing for, for the other ones, the sacred uh, garlic here, why is it the way the way? It's not very, it's not directly accessible, the reasons uh, for, for the total reduplication. Now, in addition to that, there are, there are other forms, there are other forms that are analogical total reduplication. So these are forms that do not iconically represent uh, 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 Whose total reduplication is not an iconical, iconic, iconical projection of, uh, a, uh, of a feature of the plant of animal. So in this paper, I analyzed it as um, uh, a diachronic change from CV prefixal partial reduplication to total reduplication. I will not uh, uh, waste. I will not spend time on it. Just to let you know that. Uh, so this is this is the idea that I developed because. Uh, but let me show you data. It is it is easier. So if you look at the if you look at this table, basically you can divide it in, into two. You have these these group where you have a CV a partial uh, reduplication, and then you have uh, Gizeh, Ham, and Masana where you have total total reduplication. And so there are two directionalities. Either you say the change is from because obviously there is change. So the, the directionality can be from total reduplication to partial reduplication or from partial to total reduplication. I have been defending the idea that it is from partial to total reduplication because uh, this is actually, in my opinion, uh, another way of rendering the prefix that I showed in the beginning uh, in the word for chameleon and, and so on. So that is a prefix that uh, a classifier for botanical, zoological uh, vocabulary that you find uh, in Afro-Asiatic in general, and uh, also in, in, Chadic, uh, in, in Chadic languages. So yeah, 
uh, this is something we can we can discuss later on. I think it is high time I conclude it because I'm looking at time. So as part of conclusion, uh, in the beginning I was I was asking the question on the importance of of doing this, and then uh, I think uh, I hope I was able to to show that uh, to show to give insights into the ways the Maasai people conceptualize uh, the living things in the environment. Now uh, I talk about the 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 insights into the history of the communities. I just want to, to rapidly look at, uh, uh, just want you to look at the, the pairwise lexical distance uh, calculation between uh, Ham, Masana, and Mosaic. So if you look, if you take nouns only in these languages, uh, you can see here that uh, Ham has only 50%, 15% of unique uh, voc vocabulary uh, for the nouns in general. But if you, you zoom in, uh, into specific categories, you, you begin to see that in the fish, uh, in the vocabulary for fish species, uh, ham has 45% of unique unique vocabulary compared to, to masana and, and mosaic. Why is this interesting? Uh, Belis, uh, in this 2006 paper, uh, uh, makes some ad advocacy for, for the description of, of ham. Because actually, uh, Ham is spoken by less than 5,000 people. And it seems uh, the Ham people have completely changed their way of life and they have adopted the way of life of the Masa people. And so they, they, they are changing their lifestyle because in, in the beginning, they were fishermen and now they are becoming pastoralists just like the, the, the Masa people. And so now, although the, the Ham language is dangerously shifting uh, towards the direction of Masana and Musei, we can still find traces of the fact that this was actually uh, initially uh, a, a fisherman community, uh, uh, as you can see from the richness of its vocabulary uh, concerning fish species. So this is this is some interesting insight that you can get uh, from from this. And uh, I I also tried uh, I also tried a, a phylogenetic reconstruction using a, a computer based. Uh, Computer-based approach uh, with this uh, with LinkPy, uh, with LinkPy, and yeah, there is a, there is some high degree of cognacy between uh, the different languages. But it is interesting to see how uh, how uh, the, the different languages are clustered. Uh, the the languages that are suspected to be dialects of the same thing are, uh, are clustered together because yeah, I used uh, 146 biological terms. You see, Gize and Masana are together. They are suspected to be one language, uh, Marba Leo together. The only difference is the position of Ham. In the, in the classification I showed in the beginning, Ham was in the mosaic section according to Melis, but here it is, it looks like an early division of Massa uh, 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 of Massa. So there is there is probably something that needs to be to, to be verified there and it is interesting that the vocabulary uh, of the fauna and flora vocabulary gives this information. Now, I also talked of the, 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 the insights into the processes of lexical creation and maintenance. So basically, these are, these are the things that I showed, uh, composite labels, unitary ones, metaphor-based, uh, metonymy-based, and then you have duplicative ones, CV duplication, iconic, and uh, analogical uh, duplication. These are patterns that you find out of the fauna vocabulary too. And uh, I think I was able to show that uh, there is there is some high descriptive force uh, in the in the in the in the binomial labels, which is enhanced enhanced by metaphor and metonymy. And in the reduplicative ones, you you clearly saw some some uh, some iconicity in it. So the the idea is that these these features have what Berlin uh, uh, refers to as uh, adaptive uh, significance, which makes it, uh, which makes names of plants and animals easy to learn and remember. And since there are, uh, people say, people say you can, a, a single individual can re remember 300 to 500 uh, 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 names of plants and animals. So this is, this is uh, some kind of way to cheat uh, nature since there are there are many 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 labels to learn for one simple uh, individual now uh, thank you very much for for your attention i'm leaving you with this image that i took on the field so this is this is a, a tree that i like the acacia albida 
because it is the, the guy which is always different. So this is the rainy season, everything is green around and it has the, the shape that you can see. Then in dry season, when everybody is sleeping, it is the greenest guy in town. So thank you, thank you very much for your attention. I hope we can, we can discuss a little more now. Thank you very much, Guillaume. That's very interesting. Certainly makes me wish I had some more training in biology or could get a biologist to come work with me in research as well. Um, so we have some time here for some questions and discussion. Uh, if you have a question or something you'd like to discuss with Guillaume, uh, feel free to use the raise hand function in Zoom or to write in chat that you would like to ask a question or you've, if you don't want to use your microphone, you can type out your uh, question in the chat. Uh, and I can read it for you. So we got a question already from Andrew. So Andrew, do you want to go ahead and ask your question? Thanks, Joey. Hi, Guillaume. Thanks for the talk. Um, towards the beginning, you were talking about compounds and you had mentioned that the bitter yam is called the yam of the bush. Yeah. The species of ground nut that's called the ground nut of the squirrel. And I'm wondering if this ground nut of the squirrel, is it less desirable as a human food or is it a human food at all? Uh, no, I think if, 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 I, if I remember where it is not, it is not a human, it's not human food. Because I okay. think, yeah, I this think is, it's, uh, it's right somewhere that it is not something that is edible. I just mentioned this because it's, it's a, I see in, in, uh, in Gorwa, one of the languages that I work with spoken in Tanzania, uh, a lot of the time when there's a similar plant or a plant that could be construed to sort of look like or behave like a cultivated plant, or if there's a wild berry or fruit that maybe doesn't taste as good as a garden variety, yeah. they'll uh, tack the name of, a, of an animal onto it. Ah, okay. Oh, you know, that's the... Uh, yeah. you know that's the yeah. that's the the ground out of the squirrel and it's and it's less desirable or you don't eat it so i'm it's an yeah. interesting pattern yeah okay yeah yeah really 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 interesting uh yeah so yeah because the the, the i i think the, the the general pattern is uh the more the more it has a functional importance for for the community uh there is no need for for this uh the binomial structure and then uh uh, when it is something that is less desirable for consumption, the 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 send it in the bush. Yeah, yeah. It, yeah, it makes it it makes it important as a pattern. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you, Andrew. There's a question in the chat from Pai Sukumbu that I can read out for you. Is, I wonder if you have considered whether the vocabulary are mostly borrowed by Maasai languages or whether each of each language developed them individually. Ham may provide a lead in thinking about this. Yeah, so uh, I always say this in the in the Masa, in, in our Masa group that uh, Ham Ham is a is, is a very very interesting language because it is it is really in the middle of the of the of the Masa uh, at least the northern Masa languages. There are there are there are lots of things. Uh, you, you have the impression that Ham is a, is really a conservative. Uh, a, a, a conservative uh, 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 language, and so there are, there are interesting things that you can you, you can find just from examining uh, the, the vocabulary in general and looking specifically at at ham because sometimes uh, sometimes the, the pattern is uh, either it goes with uh, masa or it goes with, uh, with with musei or it has original terms and it is I think it is hardly towards uh, marbaleo for example and. Uh, yeah, of course there is some borrowing, but this has to be controlled uh, systematically. There are there are easy ones. If you take the word for cat, for example, in these languages, it is mostly uh, paturu, uh, and I think paturu is something related to fufude, uh, if I'm if I'm not wrong. And so there is there is there, there is borrowing. There are, those are the easy ones, but for 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 the, for the ones that you can identify, you can identify easily. It is, yeah, it did something interesting that some something be, be done there to see exactly how, how it works. Are they all original terms that uh, were inherited from, from Proto-Masa? Proto uh, do we find borrowings? If yes, uh, what is the directionality of borrowing? Uh, is it a Masa internal? Is it a Chadic internal? Is it from the other uh, 
Karamawa languages that we find in the in the environment. There could be influences from from Tupuri, from Arabic, uh, and so on. So yeah, it is it is an interesting question. Okay, thanks. Um, maybe I, I can ask a question about the variation that you mentioned uh, near the beginning, and you were talking about the use of the the relativizer or relator or whatever you want to call it. Yeah. Um, where in some cases it's required, some cases you can't use it, some cases it seems to be optional. So yeah. I mean, obviously you can do this sort of diachronic hypothesis that it would have been there in the beginning, and now things are getting shorter and more compact over time. Yeah. You probably you probably don't have the data from a, a dictionary to to test that kind of thing. You would need some some obviously more sophisticated data. Yeah. I'm wondering if there's also a potential explanation that has to do with the semantics of the modifier. It seemed like the one example you gave where you can't use the relator. That was also yeah. a modifier that could be used as an abbreviation, where the other modifiers, where it was required, it seemed like a more general word, like a color word or something. So yeah. I wonder if there's something to do with the semantics of the modifier that also predicts whether that relator is going to be used when you're naming a, an animal. Yeah. So the, yeah, this is the, it is it is really really interesting your, your observation. So this is also a direction I've been I've been checking. Mm -hmm. um, for example, I noticed that when when you when uh, the, the the attributive element uh, refers to to sex, male, female, it seems you must use that thing in the middle. Mm -hmm. It seems you must use it, and then when it refers to something like color, there is you can't you can you can or you cannot use it. So it is okay. possible to have it overt or or covert. And then uh, in those in those cases where you can't identify the meanings of the the attributives independently, where they really have the impression you really have the impression that these are idiophonic idiophonic items. I'm not very sure about what I what I say, but uh, in those cases, it doesn't sound good to have the the the, the relator uh, in, in the middle. And so, yeah, definitely, there is there is something there is something to there is something uh, about the, the the semantics of the the attributive, but I don't. Yeah. So this is yeah. yeah. So maybe, maybe it's one of several factors, and so it's hard to yeah. to distinguish. Yeah. Yeah. yeah possible. But I, I have another question, but let me just pause to see does anybody else have another question or comment? Um, can be in English or in French. Si vous voulez poser une question en français, sentez-vous libre. Uh, I'll just ask a question about reduplication because uh, because I work with Bahrain, another Chadic language spoken further east in Chad. In that case, I've seen uh, names of species that are differentiated by reduplication. Does that function never? Does that never occur in the Maasai languages where you would have? A name for a for one species that then when it's reduplicated or repeated it becomes a name of a different species. I yeah so uh, I think I think I've seen I've seen something like that, but it is it is it is not very it is not a, a productive process mm, because okay. yeah because yeah if uh, yeah I have not, I think I have seen it but I don't remember exactly where and I have the impression that it is not in the northern in the northern Massa uh, Massa data but instead in the southern. Uh, Masa data. I think it should be data from Zime, uh, in which I in which I saw that kind of a thing, but not in the not in the, the northern Masa languages. So and, uh, it is very interesting to to, to, see, to see that. So uh, is it is it uh, partial reduplication? You get another species, or it's always total reduplication? Um, is it? I think there's. Well, definitely full reduplication. I think there may be partial reduplication as, as well. I mean, it's not a, a huge number of animals that I've seen do this. And I don't have a long list of, of species yeah. names anyways, but I've just seen it a couple of times. Oh, okay. Okay. Good. Well, if there's no further questions or comments, we'll uh, end our session together there. And say thank you again to Guillaume for putting this presentation together. We look forward to, to reading what you'll eventually write and publish on this topic. Uh, and certainly for me, it gives me things to think about and to incorporate into my own research as well. So thank you for, for being here to share today. Thank you. Thank you, Joe. And thank you, all of you, for coming. And uh, thank you for, for, for this uh, dis discussion session. I hope I was not uh, too long and boring. So <laughs> that, that is great. Thank you. Thank you, everyone, for coming. Bye. Yeah. Bye.